Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself. My I'm Heather. I am part of the IAOMT. I'm um, holistic certified. I'm part of the educational committee through the IAOMT. I'm super excited to invite you guys uh, to this meeting today. We're going to be talking about oral microbiome testing. Uh, the course that we're going to cover today is to leverage oral microbiome testing for root cause insights into oral and systemic conditions, um, how to use them to improve patient overall wellness, and we will be reviewing how to interpret these tests, uh, which patients to test, and then protocols uh, for improving the balance of the microficial bacteria. Um, we will be discussing on how to um, explain the benefits of the oral microbiome testing to patients and the best practices for Im implementing this into our um, practices. Uh, uh, participants will leave with this course with a good understanding of the following learning objectives. Um, we're going to discuss the different types of salivary di diagnostic tests and how to interpret those tests. Uh, we're going to learn today on how the oral microbiome testing can give great insights into overall health and include um, including gut health conditions and nitric oxide production. Um, we're going to clarify some of the results uh, from these tests um, and how they can affect treatment plans and outcomes for patients uh, with managing chronic uh, tooth decay and gum inflammation and how to identify and manage halitosis concerns. Oh, uh, we're gonna discuss how to uh, nourish yeah. our good bacteria with diet and lifestyle changes. Um, and one of the big outcomes of this course is so uh, we can understand how to recommend uh, microbiome testing and those benefits to our patients. And here today are um, two of the CEOs from Bristle Health. And um, David Lynn is the co-founder and chief scientific officer at Bristle. He has received his PhD in, uh, in microbiology and immunology from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and his master's degree in biology from California State University in Fullerton. He has extensive background in infectious disease and genomics which is highlighted by his 11 peer review publications, which six is, um, he's listed as the first author. Brian Maurer is also a co-founder at Bristle. Brian's background is driving the adaptation uh, of genomic technology in healthcare. His passion is personalized medicine and improving patient outcomes and works with providers for implementing Bristle Health. And just a little disclosure, I am one of the oral health coaches hired um, by Bristle. So I get to look at all of this in exciting information. And if your parents are do or your patients are doing um, any of the co health coaching, um, I am one of the health coaches that gets to explore the oral microbiome with your patients. All right, take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. On my slides right now. Thanks, Heather, for the great intro. Um, so we can skip the slide. We can also skip my intro slide because Heather did a great job. Um, so just the the first slide is conflict of interest. Of course, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Bristle, and so uh, Bristle's Bristle's very important to me, not only financially, but just you know. Uh, <laughs> deep in my soul. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always email me, david at bristlehealth.com, or of course, uh, Brian as well. So brian at bristlehealth.com. Okay, next slide. So today, um, if we have five basic course objectives. The first is uh, to talk about different types of salivary diagnostic tests and how you can interpret their results. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the oral microbiome itself um, and what kind of insights it can provide. Um, by, by testing the oral microbiome. Um, we are also gonna talk about how this affects your treatment plan. So how this actually affects a patient. So it's not just a bunch of data, it's you know uh, what are the recommendations I can make based off of the oral microbiome. Um, and some of those recommendations are about nurturing the good bacteria and what the data says about you know, how, to, how to improve the beneficial bacteria so that you can reduce um, uh, oral disease. And the last one is just how to talk to patients about this because patients aren't really well informed about the oral microbiome. A lot of them aren't even aware that a lot of disease is driven by uh, bacteria, fungi, and viruses in the mouth. Okay, so 
Uh, brief background on the oral microbiome. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, most of you have heard of this, uh, but it's just a community of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that live in the oral cavity. So um, the mouth is the start of uh, the GI tract. Um, and just like the rest of the gut, it's almost completely colonized by bacteria. Um, so there's over 700 different bacteria species that have been identified as part of the oral microbiome. Most people have around 100 to 200. Um, sometimes people have fewer, sometimes people have more, but on average, it's, it's somewhere between 100 to 200. Um, and for decades now, we've known about the association between the bacteria in the mouth and oral disease. Um, and I'll get into this later. Um, but what this means is that uh, if you can look at the oral microbiome, um, then that means you could likely affect the progression of those diseases uh, because it's basically an early signal um, that something is going on in the mouth and uh, you can do something about it to reduce uh, the chance or the progression of disease in the future. All right, next slide. So uh, most importantly uh, about bacteria is that they really like to grow in their home. Uh, so they're kind of like people in that they don't just grow uh, free floating and, and out in, in the universe. Uh, they like to stick to a surface and to stay there. Um, and so that, that surface that they build for themselves is called a biofilm. Um, and in most cases in the human body, these biofilms actually contain many different types of bacteria. So it's not just one species of bacteria. So uh, you and your family may be one species and they live in, in the house, but really it's multiple families. It's different types of bacteria that are uh, together uh, in this biofilm, in this home. And because all of them are different, they can all produce different types of molecules and they all interact with each other differently. And this is what uh, creates kind of this, this milieu, this environment that can either foster disease or foster homeostasis, so, so balance. Um, uh, let's, let's see, so really importantly, um, this biofilm doesn't just exist in one surface of the mouth. So it's not just on your teeth, it's not just on your gum line, it's everywhere. So uh, everywhere from the roof of your mouth to your tongue, to your tonsils, to the throat, um, and, and uh, beneath the gum line, above the gum line, all of this is colonized by different types of bacteria. At least normally, uh, uh, in, under healthy conditions, there's specific species that live in, in each of these conditions. And this is mostly driven by the environment. Okay, so uh, some bacteria prefer different types of oxygen, different levels of oxygen, I should say. Um, so some of them are aerobic, so they can tolerate very high levels of oxygen, and other ones are anaerobic, so they really like living without any oxygen. And this means that they will end up building their houses in different places. Um, so of course the tongue, uh, the top surface of the tongue has a lot of oxygen, because as you breathe, you're, you're introducing oxygen there, but in the crypts of your tongue, there may be, um, uh, it's more anaerobic, so there's no oxygen there. And this, the same thing happens beneath the gum line, there's almost no oxygen, but on the surface of a tooth, there's a lot of oxygen. Um, so all of this just to say that uh, all the different surfaces are coated in the microbes in your mouth, in the oral microbiome. And all of these microbes, they all end up uh, getting shed in this uh, wonderful solution uh, that is always being created in your mouth and it's called saliva okay so uh, you and uh, everyone you know has thousands of salivary glands okay and these are all very small and they're constantly secreting this this fluid that helps to uh, prevent uh, oral disease that it actually helps to reduce the abundance of bacteria in your mouth because there's antimicrobial compounds in it it also helps to uh, limit their adhesion to the surface um, because there's uh, uh, mucins, there's different proteins in there that, that prevent bacteria from sticking uh, and creating very large biofilms. And so it reduces the size of the biofilms. And so there are you know, uh, three major salivary glands, but there are thousands of minor ones. And that's why you, your, your mouth is constantly coated with saliva. And so saliva is this wonderful solution that doesn't just protect you, but we also use it as a diagnostic tool because Saliva comes from everywhere. So all the bacteria from your mouth, from all the surfaces, ends up in saliva. Next slide. All right, so that's the brief background on the oral microbiome. Um, so the, the first thing that we should talk about when we talk about the oral microbiome is uh, 
symbiosis versus dysbiosis. Um, and so symbiosis is a state of homeostasis, this is a state of balance. Um, and in contrast, uh, dysbiosis is a state of imbalance. Um, and when we talk about balance and imbalance, we're talking about basically the stability of the community um, and, and whether or not the community is easy to shift or whether or not it's, it's sitting in a state where it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna change very much. Um, and so what happens is uh, as an oral microbiome changes and it becomes more dysbiotic, you actually introduce uh, these, these pathogenic species that can uh, disrupt not only the rest of the community, but also the host tissue. So in, this, in, in a lot of cases, it's, it's the gum line. Um, and so a lot of these pathogens are invasive and, and they, they actually kill, the, kill your tissue um, and they invade the gums. And as you invade the gums, you're releasing new molecules that then cause more dysbiosis. So uh, dysbiosis is kind of this, this progression towards uh, worsening disease. Whereas in contrast, homeostasis is where the tissue is not disrupted and these bacteria live symbiotically with your tissues and, and they, don't, they don't break down your teeth and they don't break down uh, your gum line. And so they just live harmoniously. Um, and so the, the best analogy I can always come up with is that the oral microbiome is like a garden. Um, and in this garden, uh, you're, you're maintaining it constantly. So if you're doing a really good job of, of, of doing your routine and uh, plucking the weeds uh, and mulching over any empty space and adding in, uh, adding in uh, like uh, flowers or, or bushes where there's empty space, um, then that's great. You're in homeostasis. But uh, if you're not maintaining it and you get weeds, one weed can then become 10 weeds the next week, which is then 100 weeds the week after. And if you don't do anything to maintain, all of a sudden, even if you tried to maintain it, it would be almost impossible because you'd have 1,000 weeds. And even if you pick 900, the next day, you're still going to have 1,000 weeds. So um, that's the analogy that I think I'll turn to for, for a lot of this uh, webinar. Next slide. So, uh, the reason dysbiosis is so important is because the most common oral diseases in the world are all caused by oral microbiome dysbiosis. 25% um, of adults, untreated tooth decay, 90% of all adults have at least had one cavity, uh, and about half of all people over age 30 have some form of gum disease. Um, and these are the most prevalent diseases in the world, and they're caused by oral microbiome dysbiosis. Um, so just in the two examples, the first is in, in caries. Um, so uh, pathogenic microbes, um, they, they live in this biofilm and sometimes they, uh, it becomes dysbiotic and as they grow, uh, they create acid. Uh, and this acid actually erodes the enamel, of course, and this leads to tooth decay. And uh, if you don't maintain it, and you don't remove them, it's uh, uh, very difficult to maintain. You end up with, with caries. Um, however, uh, actually, can you go back to the back sli last slide? Um, commensal microbes actually help to uh, combat this. So they can produce neutralizing molecules like ammonia that actually neutralize the acid. They also produce bacteriocins that can kill the pathogenic microbes and prevent them from invading. Uh, but if you don't have them, uh, you end up with just these pathogenic biofilms that are constantly growing. And even if you do maintain them, you can still have these microbes and uh, they, they slowly cause decay. Uh, okay, so next slide. Um, and the same thing happens in gum disease, right? So uh, on the image on the left, you can see the, the tooth on the left is, is healthy. So these are healthy gums where you have what's known as homeostasis, host microbe homeostasis. There's a good biofilm living there because uh, it's symbiotic. Um, but in gum disease, um, you get these dysbiotic biofilms that are growing and they cause damage, which then uh, progresses to disease. And similarly, you can also have commensal microbes um, in homeostasis that prevent the, the pathogenic ones from outgrowing and from causing dysbiosis. So the way this happens is just by competing. So a lot of times they just fill the space, kind of like if you, grew, uh, if you grow grass um, in the space, then the weeds are less likely to pop up because the grass is taking space. Um, they can create these molecules called bacteriosins that can kill other pathogenic bacteria. They produce hydrogen peroxide, which is an oxidizer, which can kill pathogenic microbes. And really importantly, they also help to hone, they, they tune the host tissue. So they hone the, uh, the uh, immune system and they teach it to not become uh, hyperactive uh, in the cases where it sees Fusobacterium or it sees P. gingivalis. It tells it, hey, it's kind of okay. Like, the bacteria will deal with it, 
don't let the immune system do too much. Otherwise, it's going to cause damage because a lot of times uh, the immune system is actually what causes a lot of the damage. Um, and the oral microbiome is also implicated in a number of other diseases. So it's not just gum disease or, or cavities. It's also halitosis, uh, burning mouth syndrome, oral thrush, and lastly, gut inflammation. Um, so a lot of bacteria in the mouth, they actually traverse into the, into the intestine and down to the colon. And uh, they can colonize in places that they normally wouldn't be. And um, this ends up causing uh, gut issues uh, for a lot of people. Um, and so uh, just leaning on from the gut issues, it's, it's not just uh, the gut, but it's actually the rest of the body that's also affected by the microbes in the mouth. And so uh, recent research, let's say in the last 10, 20 years, has found that uh, a number of microbes uh, can be found uh, in higher abundance in certain types of disease. So Alzheimer's disease, um, I think there's a very compelling story to be said with P. gingivalis and, and Alzheimer's disease and the association there. Um, cardiovascular disease. So it turns out that atherosclerotic plaque, the plaque that builds up in people's arteries, is actually full of these bacteria. And uh, it's full of bacteria from the mouth specifically. And, and, and they find that uh, ones that are higher in, in, in the mouth, they're more likely to be in, in athero, atherosclerotic plaque. Um, same thing with the gut. So uh, not just in IBD or inflammation, um, but also in colorectal cancer. Uh, so there's a, the, the causal association between Fusobacterium nucleatum and the size of tumors. So if you have Fuso uh, that colonizes a colorectal tumor, you end up with uh, worse disease progression and worse outcomes for the patient. Um, and of course, in uh, pneumonia, uh, a lot of times the, the bacteria from the mouth end up uh, causing pneumonia, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and, and uh, finally diabetes. Um, so there's a lot of associations between uh, the oral microbiome and, and not just oral disease, but also the rest of the body. All right. Um, and so we're going to get into uh, a little bit about specific tests um, and, and why some of them are, uh, you, are, are more useful than others in certain, in certain cases. Um, and the first thing that we have to talk about is how these different tests work. Okay, so uh, in this table, uh, there are four rows. The first is the data type, um, and this basically is what we're talking about when when uh, we're looking at the raw data that comes out of each of these tests. Okay, the second row is the type of organism that you can get from that data type. Um, the next one is resolution. Resolution is really important. It's how finely you can look at uh, at a different microbe, um, and and there will be a slide dedicated to this that I'll talk about. And the last one is functional profiling. Um, that we'll also talk about, but functional profiling basically tells you, can you look at what the bacteria are doing? Uh, not just whether or not they're there or not. So um, on the different columns, the far right is the oldest technology. It's conventional microbiology. It's what, what a lot of uh, people are familiar with because it's still taught in schools. It's basically you take the saliva or you take uh, a swab sample of someone's mouth and you put it on a Petri dish or you put it under a microscope and you look at it and you say, what do I think is here because of, uh, uh, what I can see with my with my own two eyes. Um, and the only thing this really tells you is the presence or absence of a microbe. And the other thing that is a major issue with this is you can really only look at the microbes that are culturable, at least with uh, plating uh, when you put it on a Petri dish. Uh, and a lot of these microbes are really difficult to grow. Uh, they're not very easy to grow. And so you don't, it's very hard to know whether or not they're there uh, without using a more uh, sensitive technology. So conventional microbiology is very old technology. It's mostly not used anymore. and um, it's uh, not not that great at looking at the, the oral microbiome. So the next is qPCR. Uh, a lot of a lot of tests still use qPCR, and this is maybe a fifty year old technology now. Um, and this really also only tells you presence or absence. So you you can't measure the, the uh, by qPCR you can't measure the entire community. Um, you can only measure very specific uh, microbes. So you can look at okay, uh, I have uh, this qPCR test, and it's only going to look at a very specific microbe. I can only look at strep mutans, or I can only look at uh, P. gingivalis. Um, but you won't be able to look at the entire garden. You can only look at how many how many rose bushes do I have, or uh, how many of this very specific type of weed do I have. But you really want to know: uh, is the rest of the community okay? Like, is my garden covered in mulch? Do I actually have bushes surrounding my trees so that they don't get 
uh, weeds that, that kill the roots. Um, so the, the next technology up that, that improves on that is 16S. Um, so 16S uh, RNA um, allows you to look at uh, all the bacteria in a sample. So here we are looking uh, at the entire community. So we're looking at not just P. gingivalis, but we're looking at other types of porphyromonas. And we're looking at other types of tanarella. We're looking at everything, um, but we can't look uh, very deeply at them uh, using 16S. So you can't tell what they're doing. Um, you can't tell what kinds of genes they have. Um, you only look at bacteria, and we know that fungi and parasites and viruses are also an important part of the community. Um, so 16S in that way, um, it's kind of lacking some information. And so uh, the last one is shock and metagenomics, which is the most sensitive technology. We're actually looking at every gene of every microbe in the sample. Um, and because of that, we are not only looking at bacteria, we're looking at fungi, viruses. Um, and very importantly, we look all the way down to the strain level. Um, so the next slide, I think, um, in two slides, it'll talk about it maybe. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, so we can skip to the next slide for now. So here's a table that describes the different tests um, and the technologies that they use. Um, and uh, like I talked about with qPCR, you're not really looking at the community. You're only looking at very specific microbes. And so you're losing a lot of the picture. You're actually losing very important parts of the picture. Um, so the only two tests that don't use uh, qPCR um, have something added on top of qPCR are the PeriDX from MicrogenDX, which uh, has one aspect of the test that uses 16S um, that only looks at the bacteria. And then there's the bristle test. Uh, the bristle test, of course, uses shock and metagenomics. You also detect fungi, uh, and you're looking at all the different bacterial species. And you can see the different price points for each of the tests. Um, so PeriDX being the most expensive, bristle being the next. Uh, and then uh, oral DNA uh, and down. Next slide, next slide. Okay, so this is where we get into why why shock and metagenomics is so powerful. Um, so shock and metagenomics allows you to look at all the DNA. Um, the picture I'm showing you on the right is, uh, is a genome of Porphyrmonas gingivalis, and that genome is very big. So it's two million base pairs, okay? Two, and, all this means is uh, there's 2 million letters, A, T, G, and C, that dictate, that tell you what porphyrmonas gingivalis can do. Um, and so it has different virulence factors. It has different factors that allow it to survive in certain conditions. Shock and metagenomics allows you to look at all of those genes and measure all of the functions of those genes. All the other testing me methods do not allow you to do this. Um, and so really importantly, uh, using shock and metagenomics, just tells you what can this microbe do and how bad is it. Um, okay, the next slide. Um, so this is where we talk about resolution, about why going all the way down to the stray level is so important. So uh, if you go back to your uh, high school biology taxonomy, uh, this is the, the organization system that we've come up with to describe what different organisms uh, and how they're related. Um, and so you might remember domain, uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Turns out there's one more thing beyond species. It's called subspecies that we call strain. Um, and so the human taxonomy on the left is, of course, uh, Eukarya, Animalia, Chordata, Mammalia, Primates, Hominidae, Homo sapiens sapiens. Okay, and so this is how we describe our uh, the the most current evolution of of uh, human and classification. Um, and uh, I'll jump all the way to the right side where we also have the taxonomy for COVID, okay? And uh, I think we all know now that uh, there's a bivalent vaccine now that uh, people are using. And the reason it's bivalent is it has two different strains in it because we know that different strains do different things. So the very first COVID that came out was not as infectious as the next strain that came out, which was Omicron. So this was uh, the, the virus evolved and uh, Omicron uh, turns out to be much more uh, uh, easier to pass between people. And so we know that the different strains, they do different things uh, and they have different abilities uh, despite being the same exact species, okay? And the same thing is true for Streptococcus mutans. There are some strains that are much worse than others and that are more pathogenic. And so this is the reason that looking all the way down to the strain level is so important because we know that some bacteria, the strains, 
are different from others despite being the same species. All right, so um, <clears throat> I'd also really like to harp on the fact that uh, oral disease and oral health, the, the oral microbiome itself is driven by the community, not by individual species. So if you look back at gum disease and, and that biofilm, you remember that many different species live in that biofilm. It's not just one. Um, and the interactions between those, those microbes is actually what, what drives uh, differences in, in disease. Um, so if, if you have good microbes that are helping to prevent the bad ones from, from outgrowing, then even if you have the bad ones there, you might not be in such a bad condition because the garden is actually, the, the rest of the, the plants in the garden are helping to reduce the amount of weeds. Okay. Um, and they're all competing for space, they're all competing for nutrients, and we want to keep that garden healthy. Um, so if you measure only one thing, you're not actually looking at uh, what's important uh, in disease. Okay, next. So uh, here, we've there have always been a lot of questions about what the difference between uh, the different technologies and how they measure the different microbes. And so uh, here we talk about two different things. It's called relative abundance, which is the levels of these microbes to one another. So if you can imagine in the garden, uh, if you look at an orange tree, um, you could count every single orange on the tree, right? Um, but uh, is that really useful? Because if I tell you your orange tree has 130 oranges on it, is that gonna tell you whether or not your orange tree is healthy or not? And it turns out that's not the case because you know that, uh, uh, well, you, you you don't have the information uh, that you need to make that decision. Basically, uh, we can tell you uh, that that a healthy orange tree has 150 oranges. So really 130 would be pretty low. Right? So measuring the absolute abundance of, of the oranges on the tree does not inform you uh, about the health of the tree or the community. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, and uh, here's an example of why absolute abundance and relative abundance, uh, it's a very important concept to remember. Um, so if you measured the absolute abundance of pathogenic microbes, let's just say it's P. gingivalis here, between patient one and patient two, okay? And both of these patients have the same levels, okay? And uh, here, uh, in this case, we wouldn't know what to do between the two patients because they look exactly the same. But one might not have disease and the other might have disease. Now, we're, we're kind of questioning uh, what do we do here? Because they look exactly the same. Next. But if we measure the rest of the community, so you measure the rest of the garden, so not just the orange tree, you're measuring all the bushes around it, how much space is there, how much mulch is there. Um, it turns out that patient one only has five copies, has the same amount of copies as the pathogenic ones for commensals, but patient two has almost 10 times this, well, nine times this, 45 copies, okay? Um, what this tells you is that patient two has uh, a healthier garden. Uh, it turns out that they have the the rest of the community there is is healthy and is helping to maintain the pathogenic ones at a lower level. Um, and so, if if you measure by relative abundance, you can see the pathogenic one is only ten percent on the right, but it's fifty percent on the left. And so, if you have status here, we would know now patient one is in dysbiosis. They have a lot of these pathogenic ones, whereas patient two actually doing pretty well. Um, and this is just a data slide, basically to demonstrate if you use uh, this, this relative abundance measurement, you can actually come up with disease risk scores. Um, and this can be used to predict whether or not someone has periodontal disease or will have periodontal disease or have cavities um, in the future. Um, and so this is just some bristle data from uh, the University of uh, Pacific that we collaborated on to, to demonstrate the utility of uh, measuring relative abundance um, in the oral microbiome. Next slide. Okay, keep going. I'm going to speed up a little bit, I think. Keep going. Um, so when to use this? Uh, the first is on new patients. Um, and, and usually people use this to establish a, a baseline um, and uh, help to prevent uh, issues in the future. Next slide. Also for frustrated sufferers, so there's a lot of patients, of course, that you may you may have that say that they're doing all the right things, or brushing, flossing, uh, maybe they're they're uh, taking an oral probiotic, or or they're uh, improving their diet, um, but it could be that these microbes were never dealt with in the in, in the first place, and so they're still experiencing these issues, still experiencing gum disease or, or cavities. Next. 
Um, so I'll just go through one case study of uh, uh, oral microbiome testing. So there was a 37 year old male who came in who was experiencing something weird. Um, and so this is another use case. It's, it's for the unknowns. Um, this person had water blisters for about one times, well, once a month. Um, they had tried a bunch of things um, and none of them had worked. Uh, they tried to do Profi, SRP even, um, antibiotics, and it still didn't go away. Um, and after testing, it turns out that they had a very strange oral microbiome, a lot of uh, serratia marcescens. Um, and so this is an opportunistic species that can cause gum inflammation. Um, where it comes from, we're not always sure, but this patient had it. And so what this did was it allowed us to tailor a treatment plan to help to get rid of the serratia. Okay, so in the first few months from November to February, um, they tested, uh, but they weren't sure what to do at the time because they didn't, uh, they, we had never seen this before and they had never seen it before. And at this time they were still visiting their dentist um, to try to, to clear it out. So they, I think they tried Profi um, and uh, uh, maybe they had an SRP in between, but nothing had changed. Um, so then uh, we tried to tailor a treatment plan to add more xylitol. Um, and so first the xylitol helped to reduce some of the symptoms, but the serratia didn't go away. So xylitol actually prevents serratia from, from uh, expressing virulence factors, uh, but the serratia is still there. Um, so next we introduce the probiotic that can help to combat the, this uh, uh, species and the serratia went away. Um, and, and so uh, basically uh, using oral microbiome testing, we could tailor a treatment plan to, to fix these very strange and unknown things that are happening to some of our patients. Next slide. Um, and uh, some of your other patients may also complain of halitosis or burning mouth, uh, thrush. Um, in all these cases, oral microbiome testing is also really useful. So in halitosis, you can look at the different microbes that can cause bad breath. Uh, you can look at the viruses that cause burning mouth and you can call, look at the fungi that cause oral thrush. Um, so uh, it's really important to introduce uh, oral microbiome testing to some of these patients as, as kind of a, a lab work for them uh, for data-driven decisions. Um, also, uh, there are at-risk patients, of course, um, where symbiosis can very quickly shift to dysbiosis. And so you may want to monitor them more, more uh, deeply and, and give uh, more health insights, and so, such as people with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, even ones with Alzheimer's or gut disorders, um, because a lot of them may have dysbiosis uh, very quickly, um, and uh, especially for people who are at risk. Uh, so even in compromised patients who can progress their gum disease or cavities very quickly and, and people who are pregnant. Okay, next slide, and next slide. And I'm gonna pass it off to Brian now, thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, David. So I'll be getting into uh, how our practices are utilizing microbiome insights and sort of how you can interpret that and apply that to patient care. Um, I won't be using any more garden, garden analogies, so you'll have to go back to David for those. But uh, one particular use case, just kidding, David. One particular use case is answering this question of to drill or not to drill. So in your treatment planning, you're already collecting a lot of data to inform your decision making. Um, looking at things like diet, um, clinical exam, their radiographs, their restorative history. But often you'll still encounter situations like this where we can see an incipient lesion here. And so you'll go through your workup, collect data on the patient, perform your clinical exam, look into their hygiene and diet habits, their radiographs, but can still be left with this question of, do we drill here or do we? is this something we monitor? So now with oral microbiome testing, we can test these patients. And here are two actual patient results from similar situations. The patient on the right, where they have a very high abundance of tooth decay causing bacteria, is obviously presenting very differently than the patient who has no tooth decay causing bacteria found. And so when we're looking at this patient, we can now factor in the presence of these microbes into that other data we've collected to make a more informed decision. So the patient on the right, this is probably something we want to take action on because we know their symptoms are likely going to be worsening given the presence of these bacteria. Versus the patient on the left, perhaps this is a patient we're going to monitor for the, a little bit and actually see how are these symptoms progressing. 
Another note here is that if we see there's no tooth decay pre bacteria present, but we know the patient is still um, experiencing decay, this can help point to other causes of cavities like improper breathing um, or other dietary factors. So really just giving you another tool in your toolbox to make an informed decision. Similarly for periodontal patients, we can start to understand what is the severity of the infection and where is this patient trending? So clinical findings today, we can stage the patients based off our observations and off our radiographs and um, the different measurements you're taking, but it can still be difficult to know if we have a patient in stage two, are they headed towards stage three or is this something we've stabilized and was just from when they weren't flossing in college or you know past damage? And so now with microbiome testing, you can really think of this as charting the patients up top to what our current clinical observation is. And then based on their results, getting an understanding of where that patient's headed. So even if we have a patient presenting as healthy, are they in this stable state on the left? Or are we seeing a high abundance of bacteria that may be indicating they're heading towards disease? Similarly, if we have somebody in the later stages, but they're actually in that green zone, this can indicate we've done a good job of actually stabilizing that microbiome. Maybe they don't need as much work as we, we had previously thought. And for difficult patients, um, certain tests can give you insights into antibiotic selection. So if you are using antibiotics, uh, which can be effective in some cases, getting a bit more targeted on what's gonna work best for them. David touched on this, but for halitosis as well, we know how frustrating this can be. And a big source of that frustration is that it can be difficult to know what's actually causing it. People will try all sorts of different mouthwashes, gums, chews, everything. But what we've identified is the root cause of the issue is that there's multiple different types of bad breath. So we've actually coined six different types based off the oral microbiome makeup. So here in the bottom right, you can see my results. So I'm actually more prone to tongue coating bacteria. I know this. And so I can implement things like tongue scraping more often than most people. Um, but as you can see on the left, if I was struggling with inflammatory gum bacteria, tongue scraping wouldn't be effective for me. Um, or with my condition, if I was flossing all day, but never doing anything for my tongue, I'd keep experiencing those symptoms. So now we can start to give patients those insights into here's what's actually causing it. And if we don't detect it here, perhaps it is coming from the gut or another source. So again, just more targeted, more insights you can give people who are really frustrated with, with what they're experiencing. And ultimately what we wanna know is, are we making patients healthier? And now we can start to measure that. So actually with recurrent testing, we wanna get people over to this right side, actually seeing, are we shifting those gum inflammation scores down to where we want them? And now we can start to move beyond pathogenic bacteria. So David did a great job highlighting the importance of these bacteria. And so now we can start to think, you know, how are we increasing our bacterial buddies who are keeping us healthy and really preventing disease? Some of these bacteria include our nitrate reducing species. So these are actually bacteria in the oral microbiome that convert nitrate in our diet to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, I'm sure most people on here know, it's really critical for our cardiovascular and cognitive health. Um, but for too long, we've ignored the importance of our oral bacteria and the role they play. And studies have backed this up. So in one study, twice daily use of chlorhexidine was associated with a significant increase in blood pressure. And the finding was that antimicrobial mouthwashes lead to a loss of specific commensal bacteria that do perform this function of reducing nitrate. Additionally, they found that adding nitrate to biofilms uh, actually supports a demonstra or demonstrates a reduction in the anaerobic pathogens that cause gum disease and halitosis. So not just contributing to nitric oxide production, but also playing defense against some of those uh, more harmful pathogens we know. So how do we increase this? Well, one piece is obviously reducing the use of antimicrobial mouthwash. Um, Again, if we're killing these bacteria, they can't perform that really important function we need to. But also looking at interventions like diet. 
So encouraging um, your patients to look at different things like including beets in their diet or trying to include more leafy greens. Um, and then actually starting to measure with a nitrate score from bristle or with another option, how are these bacteria growing? So um, one note on here, most, uh, so if we're looking at nitrate score from bristle, for example, this is actually measuring the bacteria that create nitric oxide, so not nitric oxide itself. Um, but again, just another important part of the work you're doing in um, with proper breathing technique or with other sources of nitric oxide, being able to layer in this bacterial component. Similarly for commensals, again, David had already touched on a lot of this, but they're critical for preserving the balance of the oral microbiome um, and reducing the levels of those pathogenic microbes. And it's so cool to understand that they're releasing molecules like hydrogen peroxide or different uh, compounds that are actually uh, reducing these pathogenic bacteria. It's really helping patients understand we're gonna promote you, like we're trying to get you to a stable state where your mouth is actually doing a lot of the work for you. But how do we increase these bacteria? So one way is with diet. Um, so in addition to nitrate, arginine is a great source of um, oral microbiome health. So arginine is an amino acid. Uh, it actually has a few different functions in the oral microbiome. So one is that certain commensal bacteria metabolize it into molecules like ammonia that restabilize the pH, which we know is important in the mouth. It also gets converted into nitrate. So again, feeding that nitrate pathway that helps those beneficial bacteria we covered. And research also suggests it may disrupt dental plaque biofilm formation. So actually preventing some of these cariogenic species from taking up homes on our teeth. Um, so again, using diet as a proactive way to promote our oral health. And great sources of arginine uh, include poultry, nuts, whole grains, and um, there's also products available like basic bites that have high amounts of uh, arginine. Another great option is oral probiotics. Um, I know you all are constantly flooded with all the different types of oral probiotics, but you know we can start to get a bit more tailored because um, different probiotics are more effective or different strains are more effective for different conditions and against different species. And so we can start to get insights here. So if we're looking at somebody with halitosis versus tooth decay, for example, which types of probiotics and strains are gonna be most effective for those patients? And on the commensal bacteria piece, again, this is something we can now measure. So I show two scores on the right here. Um, if we look at somebody with a high abundance of gum inflammation bacteria, and we see one presenting with symptoms and one presenting without symptoms, often what we'll look towards is this commensal bacteria score. So you, um, and more often than not, what we'll find is the patient who has high gum inflammation bacteria, but isn't presenting with symptoms, likely has a high abundance of commensal bacteria who are helping suppress that activity. So it can help you delineate a bit between patients. Um, and I think a big piece is it helps promote this idea of oral wellness, actually moving patients towards oral health and getting them excited about getting a healthy oral microbiome instead of just trying to get a clean checkup. So really evolving the conversation and the role of um, you all as practitioners in, in helping people get to overall health. In terms of integrating it into the workflow, Sliving, uh, collecting saliva is easy. It's just uh, about a one to three minute step. I won't go into all of it, but in essence, it's spit, shake, and ship. Spit into the tube, shake it up, drop it in the mail, and then you and your patient will get those results back and can have a lot of these deeper conversations we've been talking about. In terms of the key benefits, I know we've covered a lot of them here, but a big one is increasing treatment acceptance when it's most effective. So we know patients can sometimes sit on their data or they'll hear they have swollen pockets, but it might not be resonating the same way. Um, but when they can see high abundance of P. gingivalis or high gum inflammation scores, we tend to find patients are more open to getting those treatments you suggest because they have a different understanding of the severity of where they're at. It can also be very motivating and engaging. Um, so we survey users for Bristle, from example, uh, about 80% report adopting our recommendations. 
Um, and then what's exciting is we can start to monitor the efficacy of different treatments or therapies. This is an evolving science. Oral health is an evolving science. And as we collect more data, we can start to figure out, you know, for these types of patients, what worked for them, or for these types of patients, what worked for them. And as a community, start to practice more effective and personalized care. And then lastly, being able to give those whole body care insights. So if you have somebody struggling with gut inflammation, for example, being able to show them that it may be causing from, uh, maybe coming from their oral microbiome and showing them a score of how that happens. A big question is retesting frequency. So how often should we be testing? Um, and as with most things, it's a bit patient specific, um, where if we have somebody who's undergoing a procedure, maybe we'll retest sooner so we can actually see, did we see a reduction in those pathogenic bacteria? Um, and then as we've move them more towards a healthier state? Do we see an increase of beneficial bacteria after we've put them on a three-month program? And then once they're in that stable state, maybe moving to like a six-month or uh, annual recall uh, for testing, make sure we're all, uh, everything's stable, catch any imbalances early so we can keep them in that healthy and stable state. Um, you all are the patient communication experts. Um, you know your patients better than we ever will, but we want to give just some helpful ways that we found for communicating bristle to, or sorry, communicating oral microbiome testing, snapped into it, uh, to patients. A big one is comparing it to routine blood work. People, when they go to their doctors, it's expected they're going to take a blood draw so they can look at what's the underlying biology um, with things we can't measure or see with our eyes. Similarly, um, it can tell us about the bacteria that are causing the problem that otherwise we can't measure. I think in a post-COVID world, people are a lot more open to the idea of testing and a lot more familiar with the, the important role bacteria uh, and microbes play in our health. And lastly, it's that we're trying to promote prevention. You know, we want to catch these uh, problems early so we can treat them with less invasive and less expensive and painful treatments. You know, we're really on the same side here and being able to look at this will help us make more informed decisions and ultimately keep you healthier and happier. So that's it for the content. I um, wanted to thank you all so much for being so attentive, especially on a Saturday morning. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, you can reach out to David at Bristle Health. I'm also Brian at Bristle Health. Uh, and if you wanna learn more about bristle uh, in your practice or, or how um, it can be leveraged with patients, we have the link there. And I just wanted to turn it over for questions, Heather. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions? I didn't see any pop up. Uh, I see one from Crystal. Let's see. All right, Crystal, I've been using bristle for a few months now but have a few questions. When mouth rinse is recommended, I know the recommendations are for two weeks max. For a patient who is on a 12 to 14 week protocol, how many times do they complete the two weeks using the rinse? It's recommended once or twice daily for intervals. And when using the dental focus probiotic, can patients use a digestic probiotic for the same time, at the same time? So let's, let's do one question first. So let's start with, uh, so do you want me to kind of explain the, David, do you want to maybe explain oh. how we come up with the rinses yeah. and what the recommendations are for the yeah, health coaching? So, so just uh, kind of it, it, those who aren't familiar with Bristle, um, part of Bristle, uh, what we do is you're paired up with an oral health coach, you're given a care plan based on home care. So um, when we're working with offices, we are offering office um, guidance on how to use the, the test in practice, but then we're also coupling with you as healthcare providers where we're helping with the home care portion with your patients. And it's based on the science of what they're finding is being useful for certain um, microbial colonies. So um, David, I'll let you kind of explain what the weed feed and seed process is mm -hmm. for the yeah. um, the oral microbiome that we do. Yeah, so the mouth rinses generally are broadly antimicrobial. 
Um, and so this means we're trying to avoid their use for long term. And so the two weeks is really just the first portion of of the weeding part of the the, the removing the 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 detrimental biofilm that exists. So we're basically destroying the homes that exist and we're trying to rebuild them in the second portion. So really uh, during those two weeks, um, I think it depends on the severity of disease, whether or not you're using a, using a mouth rinse once or twice. Um, it depends on the severity of the oral microbiome dysbiosis. Most of the time, my recommendation is only use it once and use it once before using an oral probiotic. So you, generally people are using it at nighttime. Um, they use, the, they brush, they floss, they use a mouth rinse, and then afterwards they come in with an oral probiotic to try and uh, seed the beneficial bacteria to, to uh, basically replace the bad ones with good ones. Um, hopefully that answered the question. The second question, uh, can they use the digestive probiotic? Yes, uh, digestive probiotics generally are pills that are, are swallowed, um, and so they don't really affect the mouth. And most of the, the, the probiotics that uh, most of the species that are in a digestive probiotic are also only going to colonize the gut, if at all. Um, whereas an oral probiotic is a mint or a lozenge that you let sit in your mouth and dissolve. And so it's going to coat uh, coat your mouth and, and um, get into all the niches and grooves in your mouth. Um, there's a third question about recommendations for toothpaste. What the studies have been completed, what toothpaste has been used. Um, in general, um, I think we are recommending the Boca toothpaste because it's uh, the cleanest. Um, it doesn't have uh, parabens, uh, SLS, uh, PFAS, um, some of the other microplastics that are problematic. It also uh, doesn't have um, some of the other ingredients that are generally common in, in a Colgate or a Crest uh, that we know are detrimental to uh, the tissues and potentially the oral microbiome. Um, Heather, I don't know if you have anything added to added for the toothpastes. We tend to recommend more the hydroxyapatite type of toothpaste. Yep. Um, and uh, there is definitely some good research out on nano hydroxyapatite and hy hydroxyapatite. So I invite everybody to sort of research on your own some of the benefits of hy hydroxyapatite. Um, but yeah, wellness and bulk are. are the the two main ones that Bristol is currently recommending for um for the oral health coaching uh part of things so um when we do our oral health coaching for someone who might be wondering because um crystal's familiar with the setting so usually there's there's a there's a 14 week process for the first two weeks we usually recommend some sort of antimicrobial unless the purpose is to increase nitrate or possibly increase the commensals. Um, and then it might be a similar phase as the second phase in the, the process. So the second process is usually um, maximizing like xylitol use, uh, the arginine and the nitrates and really working towards fertilizing the healthy bacteria when you're taking some sort of oral probiotic. So um, there's kind of a three phase uh, process or a like main phase process where we're, we're working on trying to reach homeostasis. So um, when your patients are testing with bristle, um, that's sort of the, the process that the coaching um, recommends. So it, we're really home care based, which is an amazing way for your practices to focus on your treatments, but then also have a really great support system um, with a coaching uh, process through Bristle, where you're able to have that support with the home care part of it, which we know is sometimes a challenge. Um, let's see, especially, is there more questions here? Um, I, I would like to see a script from changing to Bristle from another qPCR test. Um, we might be able to work on something like that. Muted. Uh, test is currently available just in the United States. It is something we're looking to open up in the future, um, but I did see that question there. So unfortunately, it's just the U.S. currently. And yeah, Janet, thank you for that feedback. That's something we'd be happy to work on. Um, David touched on it a bit in terms of the really understanding the community level and seeing the abundance of beneficial versus just those pathogenic species in terms of better understanding their health and 
um, ultimately transitioning them from, you know, looking at the whole microbiome community health. Um, you know, when you have, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you're just looking at pathogens, you tend to look at approaches that just kill pathogens. Um, but when we look at the whole community, that's where we can evolve it a little bit and start to incorporate diet or incorporate different things and really focus on those beneficial bacteria going up instead of just trying to bring uh, the other measurements to zero. But we'll try to get that down on paper so you don't have to remember it. And it, it I think some of the um, the qPCR tests do offer, you know, some other pathology, like you can do a separate caries test, the path, peri, uh, perial path pathology, and then candida. I work under microscope in my practice. So I can, I've had a number of patients with certain um, testing that I've done for the oral microbiome. They've tested negative for um, caries pathogens, but on my slides for the microscope, I've seen uh, candida pathogens. So I think it's important to understand that candida is also a, a driving factor, especially for gum line cavities. Um, so it's, it gives you more information in one test so that you're understanding where those caries pathogens are coming from. And then even sometimes you might have your patients testing negative for caries pathology. They're still low on candida and they are still getting cavities. So that's where, as uh, Brian said, then we have to really start looking at the gut health and nutrition and mineral deficiencies and things like that and referring for other types of things and mouth breathing, um, those types of things, seeing a myofunctional therapist. Any other questions? Janice, if you, if you message me, I'll give you um, information if you have uh, questions about the microscope. So I'll give you my personal email um, and we can talk about microscopic use in practice. It's pretty <laughs> amazing. <laughs> this is how I ended up at Bristol because I love the oral microbiome and uh, the microscope is pretty amazing. Um, just, and then even like in our practice, having them see the dysbiosis on film, you know, on, your, on their slides and then saying, okay, this is a great screening. However, I can't identify everything that's on here. And maybe we need to do some salivary diagnostics and really diving deep into the oral microbiome and finding out what the dysbiosis may be. So I, I'd be more than happy. I'm going to give you my email and you can reach out. Okay. Trying to see if you see any other questions. I don't. I think we got them all. Good. All right. Thank you, everyone. Perfect. Thanks for participating. Hope everybody found this super uh, valuable. And reach out with any questions to either um, uh, Brian or David with any other questions. Thanks to the IAOMT for hosting. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.